The Maccabees, who flourished in the 2nd century BC in Israel, were a priestly family of Jews who organised a successful rebellion against the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV and re-consecrated the defiled Temple of Jerusalem. The name Maccabee was a title of honour given to Judas, a son of Mactaius, and the hero of the Jewish Wars of Independence, 168 to 164 BC. Later, the name Maccabees was extended to include his whole family, specifically Matthias, his father, and Judas, four brothers, John, Simon, Eleazar, and Jonathan. Its use was also extended to John Hyrcanus, Simon's son, who was next in succession. There is no unanimity about the meaning of the title Maccabee. The Hebrew may be read as hammer, hammerer, or extinguisher. Throughout the 2nd century BC, the city-state of Jerusalem, Judah, lay between the two great powers of Egypt and Syria. The Ptolemies ruled in Egypt and the Seleucids in Syria. These were residual states that had been left when Alexander the Great's empire broke up about 20 years after his death. Antiochus IV ruled Syria from 175 to 164 BC. He carried the substitute name Epiphanes, a Greek word meaning God manifest, a conqueror of overweening pride as he is described in the book of Daniel in the Bible. He set out to seize Judea, which until then had been a province of Egypt. He aimed moreover to unify his vast and heterogeneous empire behind the worship of Zeus and therefore severely restricted the practice of Judaism whose strict monotheism impeded the realisation of that policy. We can see a theme of the use of war elephants against Jerusalem, and especially against the temple, in 1 Maccabees 6. The elephants were roused for battle by being given a mixture of grapes and mulberries to drink. These beasts were distributed among the phalanxes. With each elephant there was stationed a thousand men, arrayed in coats of mail, with bronze helmets. In addition, 500 picked cavalry were assigned to each beast. They anticipated every move made by the elephant. Wherever it went, they immediately accompanied it, never leaving its side. On each elephant, for its protection, and fastened to its back by a harness, was a strong wooden tower that held four soldiers who fought from that position, as well as an Indian driver. The rest of the cavalry were stationed on either side of the army so that they could harass the enemy while being protected by the phalanxes. Judas and his army advanced to give battle, and 600 of the king's army were slain. A leaser called Averan noted that one of the elephants was adorned with royal armour. Since it was larger than all the other beasts, he thought that the king must be astride it and he gave his life to save his people and win for himself everlasting renown. He courageously charged toward it through the midst of the phalanx, killing men right and left so that they fell back on all sides at his approach. He got in position under the elephant and stabbed it from below and slain it. The beast fell to the ground on top of him and he died there. Surah 105 and books 2 and 3 of Maccabees involve an evil plan devised by polytheistic royal antagonists to use war elephants to destroy a pious community of monotheistic believers. In all three texts, the polytheist evil plan is thrown into disarray and failure when responding to the believers' unyielding devotion. The true God turns against their pagan tormentors and dramatically intervenes to save his chosen people. In all three instances, the polytheistic troops who accompany the elephants are left in ruins by God's astonishing intervention. This can hardly be a coincidence. When the Quran begins in Surah 105 by asking, Have you not heard how their Lord has dealt with the companions of the elephant by making the companions plan or plot go astray? We can only assume that this familiar piece of scripture was what it was alluding to. And therefore see this 
is an exposition of the essential meaning of those Maccabean tales. The message is clear. God will intervene on behalf of the monotheistic believers against their pagan adversaries. He will set the pagans' plans to naught by sending his angels to fight the foes. We can see, for example, God sending an angel to protect the temple treasury when Heliodorus attempts to rob it. In 2 Maccabees 3 it says, But just as he arrived with his bodyguards at the treasury, the Lord of spirits and of all power caused so great a manifestation that all those who had been so bold as to accompany Heliodorus became panic-stricken at the power of God and collapsed in terror. For there appeared to them a horse, magnificently caparisoned, mounted by a rider of terrifying mien. Charging furiously, the horse attacked Heliodorus with its front hooves. The rider was seen to be to be accruited entirely in golden armour. Then two young men, remarkably strong, strikingly beautiful and magnificently attired, also appeared before him. Taking their stand on either side of him, they flogged him unremittedly, inflicting numerous blows on him. Suddenly he fell to the ground, enveloped in a great darkness. His men picked him up and laid him on a stretcher. This man, who but a moment previously had entered the treasury with a great retinue and his entire bodyguard, now was carried away utterly helpless and those under his command openly acknowledged the sovereign power of God. In 2 Maccabees 5, God sends hope to his chosen people when threatened by Antiochus by giving them a vision of protective angels. It reads, About this time, Antiochus undertook his second expedition against Egypt. It then happened that all over the city, for almost 40 days, there were apparitions of horsemen clad in gold, galloping through the air, companies fully armed with lances and drawn swords, squadrons of cavalry in battle order, charges and countercharges in this direction and that with brandished shields, massed spears and hurled javelins, and gold accoutrements, and armour of all kinds glittering brightly. Therefore everyone prayed that these apparitions might prove to be a good omen. Another example of how God put the enemies of the Jews into disarray is in 2 Maccabees 10. When the fighting reached its height, there appeared to the enemy from the heavens five magnificent men, each astride a horse with a golden bridle, and they placed themselves in the forefront of the Jews. Surrounding Maccabeus and shielding him with their own armour, they kept him from being wounded. Meanwhile, they propelled arrows and thunderbolts at the enemy, leaving them confused and blinded so that they were thrown into complete disarray and routed. 20,500 of their infantry were slain, in addition to 600 cavalry. Surah 105 refers to the polytheists being rained upon by baked clay an allusion to the fire and brimstone that God inflicted on Sodom and Gomorrah. Giving the presence of thunderbolts during volcanic eruptions that rained down fire and brimstone, the arrows and thunderbolts can be seen as a parallel to the Quran's phrase Hijaratan min sigilin, stones of baked clay, especially in each instance that the phrase is used in the Quran, it is used in relation to God's punishment. In 2 Maccabees 11 we get another example of God sending an angel to the Maccabees. When Maccabeus and his men were informed that Lysias was besieging the strongholds, they and all the people implored the Lord with lamentations and tears to send a good angel to deliver Israel. Maccabeus himself was the first to take up arms and he urged the others to join him in risking their lives to save their fellow Jews. Then they all resolutely set out together. And while they were still near Jerusalem, a horseman suddenly appeared at their head, clothed in white and brandishing weapons of gold. Together they united in praising their merciful God 
and they were so filled with a spirit of courage that they were ready to attack not only men but even the most savage beasts and walls of iron. In 2 Maccabees we see another example of the enemies of the Jews advancing on them with war elephants. The end of Minalos the Renegade. In the year 149, Judas and his men were informed that Antiochus Eupater was advancing on Judea with a large army and that accompanying him was Lysias, his guardian, who was in charge of the government. Additionally, they had a Greek force consisting of 110,000 foot soldiers, 5,300 horsemen, 22 elephants and 300 chariots armed with scythes. Asage goes on to indicate that they were in danger of losing their law, their country and their temple to the pagan Gentiles. So they prayed fervently for God to intervene to save them. He goes on to say, After giving his troops the battle cry, God's victory, he made a night time attack on the king's pavilion with a picked force of his bravest young warriors and killed about 2,000 of the enemy in the camp, also slaying the lead elephant and its driver. Eventually they filled the camp with terror and confusion and then withdrew in triumph, just as dawn was breaking. All this was achieved through the help and protection that Judas had received from the Lord. Again in 2 Maccabees 15, we see the same motifs again alluded to in Surah 105. It says, Everyone now awaited the moment of decision. The enemy was already mounting the attack, with their troops drawn up in battle formation, with their elephants deployed in strategic positions, and with the cavalry stationed on the flanks. Observing the deployment of the troops, the variety of the weapons and the savagery of the elephants, Maccabeus stretched out his hands towards heaven and called upon the Lord who works miracles, for he was well aware that it was not by force of arms, but as God himself decides, that victory is won by those who deserve it. His prayer was in these words, You, O Lord, sent your angel in the days of King Hezekiah of Judea, and he slew at least 185,000 men of Sinna Cherub's army. Now, O Sovereign of the Heavens, please send a good angel once again to go before us, spreading terror and panic. May these blasphemers who have come to attack your holy people be struck down by the might of your arm. With these words, he brought his prayer to a close. The Maccabees won decisively, cutting down, it says, at least 35,000 men. Lastly, Book 3 of the Maccabees is a book about the repression and miraculous salvation of Egyptian Jewry during the reign of Ptolemy IV Philopater. In the book, King Ptolemy IV Philopater attempts to enter the second temple in Jerusalem, but is rebuffed by divine power. He grows to hate Jews and orders the Jews of Egypt, symboled in his Hippodrome, to be executed by elephants. However, God protects the Jews and Ptolemy's elephants trample his own men instead. Given all of this, it is pretty clear that Surah 105 is alluding to the books of Maccabees. Given the standard Islamic narrative, it is pretty odd for the Quran to be encouraging Muslims by remembering when God protected the Jews from their enemies. However, if we throw out the sin, it becomes much clearer. The Quranic writers are some form of Jew and belong to essentially a Jewish sect. Surah 105 is essentially an exegesis of the key meaning of the books of Maccabees. In the next and last episode, I will look at why the story of Muhammad being born in the year of the elephant has many holes in it and is demonstrably ahistorical and contradicted by primary evidence. See you then.